All right, we are gonna get started. So our speaker tonight, Professor Michael Humer, he's a brave man, he made it here in the weather, he almost died, but he cared about you guys that much. Now, we, we already knew he was brave, though, because he lives and teaches in the People's Republic of Boulder, so. So, give it up, Professor Michael Humer. speaker a bit loud. Anyway, okay. Turn down. No, yeah, no, no, can you do that? He'll eat it. He'll or eat it. Uh, does everyone else want it that loud? Yeah, yeah. it sounds good. It sounds good. Okay, um, well, I've been doing uh, research about the justice system for the last uh, about a year, I guess. Oh, I was going to plug, this is my most recent book, which I'm going to plug. It's called Dialogues on Ethical Vegetarianism. I've been here before and talked about vegetarianism, and now I have this nice book, which you can get on Amazon. And uh, also, uh, you know, buy all of my other books, too. <laughs> all right, so, okay, so I passed out a handout, which there probably aren't enough of, but you might be able to see it. I have, uh, I was doing research on the uh, justice system, and, you know, I have two ideas about it. And uh, the first is that, first is that the justice system contains uh, a number of pervasive injustices and serious injustices. And the second idea is that agents who are involved in the justice system ought to prioritize justice, meaning um, they should put justice ahead of the law or ahead of serving their assigned role in the system or other values, uh, and you know, ahead of their career and things like that. Now, uh, you know, basically, you know, my, my work as a philosopher is uh, I basically say things that are trivial uh, as far as I can tell, like, I don't think that I have, in political philosophy, I don't think I have amazing, difficult ideas. I don't know the answers to hard questions. I just know the answers to some really obvious questions. So, like, uh, you shouldn't intentionally bring about unjust outcomes. I think that's trivial. But also, many of these trivial truths that I say uh, are widely rejected. So, uh, many of them are highly controversial, even though they're just obviously true. So, anyway. Okay, and then, uh, you, you know, that's part of my apology for why when you ask me difficult questions, I'm not going to know the answers. But I know the answers to easy questions. Okay. So anyway, about the first part, um, there are serious and widespread injustices in, in the justice system. What are these? Uh, you already know about some of these. So obviously there are a number of unjust laws, uh, the drug laws or laws against prostitution or other victimless, victimless crimes. I assume that as a room full of libertarians, you already know about this, so you don't need me to uh, talk about that in detail, and I'm not going to. Um, but let's just say there are a number of things that somebody might be brought up on charges for that don't deserve any punishment at all. Okay, another problem though is uh, there are cases where somebody does deserve punishment for something that they did, but the punishment they're going to receive is going to be unjust. Uh, and that can be because uh, the, the punishment could be inherently unjust, like it could be a punishment that no one should receive, or it could simply be a punishment that's too much for that crime. Okay, now, so, uh, apropos of this, America is experiencing a phenomenon known as mass incarceration now, um, that people like to call it. So the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world, which is quite impressive. America number one. Okay. Uh, there's a graph here that I got from Wikipedia of what has happened to the incarceration rate over time. So this is people incarcerated per 100,000 population. It used to be around 100, and it held steady that way for about 50 years until around uh, until the mid-1970s, at which point it started this meteoric rise, and it multiplied by a factor of five, right? So it's five times higher now than it used to be. Now, why did this happen? Um, Pache, most libertarians, the answer is not the drug war. So <laughs> the drug war is a factor in the incarceration rate, so it accounts for something like a quarter of the people who are incarcerated. But if you eliminate that, we still have uh, an enormous mass incarceration problem. So the main reason why this happened was there were changes in sentencing uh, to give higher sentences. So starting around the 1970s, we started giving more prison sentences for more crimes and started giving longer prison sentences. So we have these things called three strikes laws, 
whereby uh, if you have um, three criminal convictions, then your third one gets you this really long sentence, much longer than the first two. Uh, we've had these, um, uh, we had the federal government adopt the sentencing guidelines, so they started the U.S. Sentencing Commission, which produces this set of guidelines. They have like this book that judges across the country are supposed to use to figure out what sentence they're supposed to uh, produce. And these guidelines initially took discretion away from the judges and just you know, required them to give these long sentences uniformly across the country, regardless of the judge's opinion about um, the correct sentence. Uh, that subsequently was changed so that the guidelines are now only advisory. Um, so the judge is supposed to take them into account, but he's not required to give the sentence the guidelines say, okay. Uh, also, there's a kind of campaign against parole. So people, um, you know, a few decades ago got upset that criminals were getting a, a certain nominal sentence and then they would be released before that amount of time was up. They would be released on parole. So parole was abolished at the federal level and also in many of the states. So the result of this is that um, more people are going to prison and they're staying there for a longer time. Okay, now you might think, well, uh, I don't know, but maybe that's okay. You know, like, what's, uh, what's the injustice? Maybe these people deserve to be in prison for 20 years or whatever. Uh, but there is some reason to think that we're over-punishing people. So the sentences in the United States are much longer than in otherwise similar countries. Um, so uh, we give more prison sentences. So we give sentences about twice, prison sentences, about twice as often as Canada. Um, and about seven times more often than England and about 10 times more than in Germany. Uh, so in these other countries, people would get more fines instead of prison terms. And then when you do get a prison term, it's much longer. So uh, sentences in the United States are something like five to 10 times longer than sentences in France or Germany for similar offenses. Right, so uh, that's some indication that uh, we might be over punishing people. Okay, uh, another indication is there are a number of anecdotes about you know, things that have happened to people in the justice system. So I'm just gonna tell you some of these uh, you know, amazing stories that I read about. So uh, there's the case of Anthony Crutcher. Uh, this is a person who received a, a prison sentence of 60 years for selling about $40 worth of cocaine to a police informant. Okay, he did it in multiple sales, so there were distinct counts, and he had a prior record. So that earned him a 60-year prison term. Okay, there was the case of Larry Dayries, who was uh, sentenced to 70 years in prison for stealing a tuna fish sandwich from a Whole Foods market in Austin, Texas. I kid you not. And um, this was uh, partly because he had a prior record. He had like multiple previous burglary and robbery convictions. And then also it was an aggravated robbery because he had a weapon, which is that he had a three inch pocket knife like that, which was attached to his keychain, which he took out of his pocket and allegedly threatened the security guard with in order to get away with the sandwich. Okay, so that gets you a 70 year prison term in, um, in Texas. Okay, and then there was a case of Paul Hayes who received a life imprisonment sentence for uh, attempting to pass a, an $88 forged check. That was in the 1970s, uh, so it's the equivalent today of around $400. Uh, and uh, the reason that happened to him, so he was caught by the police and then the prosecutor offered him a five-year prison term. Right, so the statutorily prescribed prison term was something like between two and 10 years. And the prosecutor said, okay, so I'll give you five years in prison. Uh, otherwise, if you reject my deal, I am going to charge you under this habitual offender statute, which requires a life imprisonment term. Okay, so, and this guy said, no, I'm not accepting the five years. I want a trial. And so he went to trial and he was convicted because he was guilty and so he got the life imprisonment term. Uh, and then he appealed it because he argued that, you know, he was only given this as retaliation for insisting on a jury trial, which you would think would be illegal, uh, but the court upheld that. They said, no, they can do that. They are allowed to, uh, right. And in fact, that is uh, standard practice, that you threaten people with some drastically disproportionate punishment, right? Some enormous punishment if they go to trial, and that way you get to blackmail them into giving up their right to a trial. Um, that is our system right now. Okay, and uh, what is the problem with this? 
Right, so one of the problems with prison terms is uh, abuse in prison is rampant. So prisoners are subject to uh, physical and sexual abuse by both guards and especially other prisoners. The other prisoners are more likely to be violent, um, beating, beating each other up. Um, the most violent criminals are uh, less at risk, right, because uh, people will be afraid to attack them. So the, um, the lesser criminals are the ones who are at greatest risk of being abused while in prison. Uh, and, you know, if you were to sentence somebody to be abused in prison, that would clearly be unacceptable. So clearly a judge cannot sentence somebody as a punishment to be raped. But they can send you to a prison where they, they know that that's a likely outcome. Right Now, uh, this is highly morally problematic, right? So uh, that's one of the reasons why there ought to be a lot less use of prison, right? We should only use prison for the most uh, serious cases. Okay, so the other problem is just uh, disproportionate punishment. So that guy who tried to pass the $88 forged check, um, you know, what sentence would that deserve? So I don't know, but it's widely thought that the punishment should fit the crime. Uh, it's sometimes said that the punishment should be about as bad as the crime that somebody attempted to commit would have been. So maybe you should impose a harm that's comparable to the harm that the other person tried to impose. Or maybe you can impose a harm that's a little bit more than that, right? But it can't be like hundreds of times more, right? Okay, so you know, you all recall the Code of Hammurabi where it was an eye for an eye. Okay, so uh, what would be equivalent to an eye for an eye when you attempt to pass an $88 forge check? Maybe you get fined $88, or maybe more, like, you know, add in some extra to account for the, the chance that you might have gotten away with it, so, you, you know, you need enough to turn or something, so, and it'll make it like a $200 fine, okay? Uh, but instead, he got life in prison, right? So this wouldn't be just on, like, anybody's conception of justice, right? Like. You know, even the most hardcore uh, retributive justice advocates don't think that you give somebody a punishment that's like a hundred times or a thousand times worse than the crime itself, right? Okay, so what else? All right, now there are a number of other aspects of the system that are unjust that I'm not gonna talk about, but I talked about at the other Liberty on the Rocks in Westminster. So you probably missed that, too bad. Okay. But, uh, but my other thesis is about how people should react to the, the situation of injustice in the law. If you know that there's something about the law that's unjust, you know, and you're an agent in the system, how should you react to it? And by an agent in the system, I mean like you're either on a jury, or you're a judge, or maybe you're a lawyer, okay? Uh, so my view is, well, all of those people have an obligation to seek justice. They have an obligation not to contribute to unjust outcomes of the system, even if the unjust outcomes are prescribed by the law. All right, so why is that? All right, so, sorry, just a little more elaboration. So if you're a judge, you ought to make rulings informed by your sense of justice. You ought to interpret the law or misinterpret the law according to um, moral judgments. So if the law says that something, if the law prescribes something that is clearly immoral or unjust, you should intentionally misinterpret it. Right? That is, you should say that it doesn't mean what it does, and you should say that it means something that's more just, that you think you can get away with. Right? Um, if you're on a jury, if you think the law is unjust, you should just vote to acquit, uh, regardless of whether the evidence shows the person did it. If you think the law is generally just, but the punishment this person is going to get is excessive, then that's also a reason for acquitting. And then in that case, you have to sort of like weigh the injustice of the excessive punishment against the injustice of the guilty person going free, okay? Uh, or if you're a lawyer, you should just refuse to advocate for, um, for a legal position that you think is unjust, right? Rather, you should refuse to advocate a legal position that is unjust. So you should not attempt to get people acquitted uh, for horrible crimes where they deserve the punishment that they're going to receive. You shouldn't try to do that. And also you shouldn't represent people who are filing frivolous lawsuits or groundless lawsuits. And you also shouldn't try to defend people against having to pay uh, lawsuits that are well grounded, right? Okay, that's my view. That's what I mean about the primacy of justice, that justice is more important than these other considerations. It's more important than the law. It's more important than your role that you're supposed to play in the system. Um, and it's more important than your career. So, okay, why is this? Uh, I have a couple of arguments that I think are obvious. 
you know, these are things that I think are trivial, okay? So here's a trivial point. Um, just in general, it's wrong to knowingly contribute to injustice. Don't cause unjust outcomes knowingly. That, I think, is a trivial truth, right? It's like if you understand what unjust means. And, uh, you know, what, would, what could be the counter to that? Like, no, injustice is okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, injustice is good. No. Okay. Um, and I, uh, as far as I can tell, there are no special circumstances in the case of agents in the justice system that would override this. What are we doing? Is it too loud or too quiet? It's just a hair of feedback. Okay. Try that. Um, okay, now, so we'll have to talk about whether there are any special considerations in the case of agents in the justice system that would override the normal obligation. Uh, to avoid causing one injustice, okay? But, you know, take, a, take as an example, let's say you know somebody who has committed a murder. They call you up and they say, hey, I've committed a murder. Can you help me get away with it? What should you do? <laughs> should you try to help them get away with it? Should you, like, give them helpful advice on how to evade the police and how to hide the body and so on? No, that would be wrong. Okay, but that's kind of what lawyers do, right? You hire the lawyer and you say, hey, I committed a murder, can you help me get away with it? And then they do. Why is that okay? It would be wrong if anybody else did that. And what, just because the criminal is paying the lawyer, that make, does that make it okay? It's like, because he's taken a job to help people get away with crimes? Okay, anyway, uh, but so we're going to talk in a minute about, you know, what, what the special considerations might be, but I don't think there are any. I don't think there is any explanation of how the lawyer's situation is different from that of the rest of us. Um, and agents in the justice system who fail to prioritize justice are causing or knowingly contributing to injustice. So, for example, if you're on the jury and you vote to convict somebody, then you cause that person to be punished uh, under the law. And if it's an unjust law, then you're causing the person to suffer an unjust punishment. So, and you know, like the only choices are, well, you could vote to acquit or to convict, or you can like cause a hung jury or something like that. You can cause a mistrial, okay? Uh, but you know, if the guy gets convicted, that's an injustice. So the only alternative is to vote for acquittal. Okay, uh, if you're a judge and you give somebody a sentence that you know they don't deserve, then you're causing that person to suffer an injustice. So that's like, you know, what if I, go out and kidnap some innocent person, then I lock them in a cage for like 10 years. Okay, so the wrong that I would be doing there, that's the wrong that the state is doing when it imprisons somebody unjustly for 10 years. If you're the judge and you know that the imprisonment is unjust, then you know, you're like, you're like the kidnapper, right? He's sending somebody wrongly into that cage. Um, finally, um, if you're a lawyer and you're trying to get some heinous criminal acquitted, really like the main problem that you should worry about is that that person is going to commit the crime again. It's not certain that they're going to commit the crime again, but actually the overwhelming majority of criminals will commit the crime again. So if like you help a murderer get away with it, then there's a pretty good chance that additional people will be murdered. So, and it's like, there would have to be some really good reason that would outweigh um, you know, risking innocent people's lives. Okay, so my conclusion is that that behavior is more than normal. All right, now, I have a second argument that I think is, um, you know, trivially obvious. Uh, my argument is that, so it's the appeal to instrumental rationality. And uh, what I mean by this is, so instrumental rationality is rationality in pursuing your goals. If you have a goal, then you should pursue it in ways that make sense. And here's my assertion, the purpose of the legal system is justice. The whole reason why we have laws, where we have courts, and like we're sending people to prison, all that, the purpose of all of that is to achieve justice. Right, so to have people who did wrong things get what they deserve, and to have people who didn't do wrong things not get punished, right? That's the purpose of the system. Um, now, in general, the means to an end cannot be more important than the end itself. It would be totally irrational if somebody said, hey, I've got this means to produce this end, and in this particular case, the means is destroying the end, but I just have to stick to it, right? That would be irrational, right? So here's my example. Um, you have a friend who's concerned that his car um, might get damaged, you know, when he's driving on the highway. And you propose, hey, I know what you can do. Only drive the car in your garage. 
if you, if, you never, if you never leave the garage, the car will not get damaged. Okay, why is that irrational? <laughs> because it's, the, the purpose of the car is transportation, right? So it's, it's putting the means above the end. If you, if you do that, then you've defeated the purpose of having a car. So you preserve the car, which would make sense normally, but it doesn't make sense at the cost of the thing that's the whole reason why you have the car. All right, so similarly, the idea of preserving the law at the expense of justice is irrational, right? It's like preserving the means to an end at the cost of giving up the whole thing that's the purpose of having that. Okay, now I'm gonna discuss some objections, so that's my main part. My main thing is uh, talking about things that other people say about why you have to prioritize the law. Uh, these are things that you will find, uh, th these will be said by judges sometimes, sometimes in their opinions, or sometimes uh, they will make public statements. Uh, so there was an essay written by Robert Bork um, back in 1999 in which he said some of these things I'm about to ridicule. Okay, uh, in case you don't remember, Robert Bork was a federal judge who was nominated to the Supreme Court by Reagan, but he lost, uh, he was not confirmed. Um, but, you know, he was a prominent conservative judge for many years. Um, I don't think he's alive anymore, right? He must have died in old age, right? Anyway, okay, so, um, these are things that people say. And by the way, I'm gonna say, I don't, maybe I shouldn't comment like this, okay, but you hear some of the dumbest arguments, okay? <laughs> maybe, I, oh, I'm unfairly prejudicing you. Maybe I should just, like, present these arguments and let you decide whether they're the dumbest things you've ever heard. But anyway, okay, here's the thing that people say. Well, you know, you don't really know what is just or unjust, but you know you can easily know what is legal or illegal. So that's why people who are operating in the justice system should just try to uphold the law. They shouldn't try to uphold justice in some like objective moral sense, right? All right. So this is a quotation from the fictional Thomas More. Um, I know what's legal, not what's right, and I'll stick to what's legal. I'm not God. Okay, now that was not said by the real Thomas More, that was said by the fictional character Thomas More in the play, A Man for All Seasons, uh, written by Robert Bolt, okay? But, um, you know, that is uh, what Robert Bolt imagined that, um, that Thomas More would have said. Okay, and that is quoted approvingly by Robert Bork. Right, so, good argument, I think. Okay, no, no, that's not good, okay, so let's point out some of the problems with this. Uh, so, first problem, okay, I mean, first you have to, interpret what they mean by are not knowing what is just or are not knowing what's morally right? Do they mean we're not 100% certain? Or do they mean like you can't even make any reasonable judgments at all? Okay, so if the point is we're not 100% certain of what's just and unjust in all cases or in any case, I don't know. Um, if that's the point, okay, you don't have to be 100% certain of what achieves a goal in order to pursue that goal. If that was required, then we couldn't pursue any goals. By the way, we also couldn't pursue upholding the law because you can't be 100% certain of what the law requires. In fact, there are many cases in which you're very uncertain of what the law requires because sometimes it's ambiguous, sometimes laws conflict with each other, um, and sometimes you know they're just like vague terms that are open to judgment in the law. Nobody says, oh, so therefore, don't even try to apply the law in those cases, right? They don't say that, right? So, so if uncertainty about what the law requires doesn't mean that you can't even try to apply it, then uncertainty about what justice requires doesn't mean that you can't even try to pursue justice, right? Um, you know, another example, uh, I value wealth. So I could pursue wealth rationally by, say, investing in the stock market. But I'm not 100% certain that that's going to get me more money, right? I'm not even close to certain, right? <laughs> Nothing close to that. But that doesn't mean that I have no reason to do it, right? It doesn't mean that I can't pursue that at all. It just, like, I only need to have some reasonable judgments about what would be more or less likely to get me more wealth. Similarly, I only need to have some reasonable judgments about what's more or less likely to be just in order to be pursuing justice, right? Okay, uh, another point. Okay, look at the examples that I listed before, like the guy who gets the 60 years in prison for selling $40 worth of cocaine. Is the idea of this objection that nobody knows whether that was just or unjust? Really? 
Right? Nobody knows that. If anybody knows any moral judgment, I know that. I know that one. I know that was unjust. Like, I don't know what the reason is for doubting that. Um, the only thing that I can think of is maybe the people are radical skeptics and they think nobody has any moral knowledge, okay? There are some philosophers who have that view that nobody knows any moral proposition at all. Okay, if you hold that view, then it would be true that you can't pursue justice because you have no idea, okay? Okay, but this is an incredibly implausible view. And notice that if you hold that view, you also have no reason at all for trying to uphold the law because you have no, like, you don't know whether upholding the law is good either. Maybe violating the law is good. Also, by the way, the legislators would not know anything about morality either. If we don't know anything about justice, then the legislators don't know anything about justice. So what reason is there for trying to follow the law? OK, uh, and then you know, and the last point is the law itself is often uncertain. And by the way, one of the reasons why the law is often uncertain is that it often appeals to moral judgments. Is there are cases where you have to make a moral judgment in order to faithfully apply the law. So there's a, there's a provision in the Constitution according to which uh, private property cannot be taken for public use without just compensation. And it uses exactly that word, just, and there's no further elaboration. There's no specification of what is just or unjust. So you have to use your moral judgment in order to faithfully apply that provision of the law. Constitution, by the way, is the highest law of the land. So, like the fact that you have to use these moral judgments in applying the Constitution, uh, that affects statutes because you have to apply the Constitution in order to know what statutes are valid. Uh, you also have things like the prohibition on unreasonable searches and seizures, but there's no elaboration. It doesn't tell you what is reasonable or unreasonable. So, you have to use your moral judgments there. Uh, and then there's the uh, the famous Ninth Amendment which is like maybe the vaguest provision in all of law, right? Which uh, it refers to unenumerated rights retained by the people. It doesn't say what they are. They're unenumerated by definition. And it just says, you know, the fact that there are some, that the existence of certain enumerated rights in the Constitution should not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And then there's no elaboration. Now, presumably the purpose of that was to protect these unenumerated rights, but they didn't tell you what they are, so how, how do you do that? Now, if you just ignore the Ninth Amendment, then you're not faithfully applying the law, because they intended you to, like, presumably they intended um, somebody to be respecting these unenumerated rights. So what you have to do is you have to make moral judgments about what rights you think people have. Okay. Um, Nobody says that, oh, so we should just like ignore all of, the, all of the provisions of the Constitution that require moral judgments because there's no way to apply them. No one says that, right? So, um, you know, it can't be the case in general that you just can't make any moral judgments, right? Okay. Uh, that was the knowledge objection. Here's the second type of objection that I hear. All right, so some people, upon hearing the thesis that you should only pursue justice, um, they interpret that to mean you should pursue whatever you believe to be just, possibly capriciously. And then they start giving examples of people who have absurd beliefs about justice. So, for example, there's some extremely racist jury that thinks that it's okay to commit hate crimes against minorities. And then that jury is hearing a case in which somebody is being prosecuted for hate crimes. And then the jury, should the jury vote to acquit? Okay, so the jury thinks that it's okay to commit hate crimes, and therefore it would be just to acquit the defendant even though he did it. All right, that's, that's the example, right? Okay, and then people say, humor, doesn't your view imply that they should acquit that person? But that's wrong, they shouldn't acquit, so they should convict that guy, right? Okay, so, uh, yeah, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with this objection? All right, so uh, notice that what the ob objection is doing is identifying what is just with whatever you believe to be just, however irrationally. Even if you can just like randomly decide anything is just and then that's the same as what is just. Um, no. Uh, notice that if you think in that way, you can also give a compelling argument against um, trying to uphold the law or anything else. Because you could just give an example of somebody who has absurd beliefs about the law. So suppose that I have the absurd belief that the law requires me to murder 12 innocent people. Okay, now, so should I then murder 12 innocent people? Okay, now, 
like the style of argument, like the style of objection to the idea that you should follow the law is the same as the style of objection to the idea that you should pursue justice, right? It's like, okay, there's a guy who thinks that following the law requires murdering 12 innocent people. Should he murder 12 innocent people? And then you want to say, no, he shouldn't do that. And so, okay, why not? Okay, now the person who favors following the law would say something like, well, because that's not what the law says. So he's got false beliefs, and they're also like unjustified and irrational beliefs. Okay, but then, you know, the, the um, advocate of justice should say the same thing about justice, right? Justice does not require acquitting people who commit hate crimes. And, you know, that guy has a false or ir and irrational belief, right? Just like the guy with the false irrational belief about what the law says, okay? All right, what else? Um, anyway, you know, try to, so imagine that you're on the jury in that case where the guy was going to be sentenced to 60 years for, um, for selling drugs. Now, the jury doesn't get to decide the sentence. They can only decide whether to acquit or convict. Also, the judge will typically not inform them of what the sentence is. So if you were on this jury, let's say you looked it up online and you found out that this guy's gonna get 60 years if he gets convicted. Okay, and then, so you think, wow, that's unjust. I think we should vote to acquit this guy. Okay, now imagine another juror in the jury room saying, no, because what if there was like this racist jury that voted to acquit a hate criminal because you know they were sympathetic to the criminal? So that would be wrong. Therefore, it's also wrong to acquit the, the drug seller. What? Okay, so how, how does the logic of that go? So now I try to fill in. There's some gap here. You gotta like fill in the extra premise that gets you to that conclusion. Okay, I'm trying to fill it in here. Uh, maybe the premise is, if senten sentencing somebody to 60 years for selling $40 worth of drugs is wrong, then also punishing somebody for committing hate crimes is wrong. Uh, Okay, does that sound right? No. <laughs> right, uh, maybe, the, maybe the premise is, um, you know, these two judgments are equally good. Like the judgment that it's wrong to punish hate criminals is equally reasonable or equally likely to be correct as the judgment that it's wrong to sentence the guy to 60 years. Um, is that the premise? Or maybe the premise is, you know, if extreme racists don't know what is just, then nobody knows what's just. Like, if they could be wrong about that, then none of us have any reason for believing anything about justice. Okay, and now, these don't sound like things that somebody would say, but these are the things that you'd have to say to fill the gap in the argument. You'd have to say something like that in order for this argument to make sense. But all of those premises are absurd, right, on their face. So obviously the, the racists do not have an equally good belief as we have when we say, you know, I think it's unjust to give that guy the 60 years. Okay, moving on to the third objection. Um, uh, you might think, well, people have an obligation just to follow their socially defined role. Now, so this is something that people sometimes talk about in, in moral philosophy, that there are these role obligations that when you accept a certain socially defined role, you can be obligated to kind of perform according to the general expectations that other people have of the person in that role. So um, if you're a doctor and you, know, you take on a patient voluntarily, then you get this obligation to play the role of a doctor in the way that is expected by the patient. So you're obligated to advise them on their health or something. You're obligated to volunteer advice that you have um, that you think is particularly relevant about how to avoid, um, you know, they're getting sick or getting injured or whatever, um, to avoid threats to their health, which you would not be obligated to do if they're not your patient, right? So like you don't have to volunteer advice to just other people if you see somebody who you think, hey, you know, you're overweight. Let me give you some advice on that. You don't have to do that. But you might have to do that if you're a doctor because you took on that role, okay. So you might think, well, maybe if you become a lawyer, then you just have to play the role of a lawyer as it's understood in your society uh, because you voluntarily accepted the role. And, like, you wouldn't normally have to do those things, but you do if you, like, volu you volunteer to become that kind of person, right? Uh, you might also think that if you get on a jury, you know, uh, you are. So you're sort of required to serve on the jury, but not really. Right, so whenever you serve on a jury, to. you don't have to. 
Uh, it's not enough to just say, I don't want to serve, they won't let you off for that, but it's so trivially easy to get kicked off that you know you can't really say that they're coercing you to serve. Okay, so, if, by the way, if you, if you want to get kicked off a jury, just use the expression jury nullification sometime during the jury selection process. Just use it in any sentence and you'll probably be kicked off. You, you could even say, I don't know what jury nullification is. What do you think? Can you explain that? We'll probably be kicked off. Okay. Um, but anyway, so you might think, okay, so look, you're kind of on the jury because you agreed to do it. Um, and when you do that, by the way, they kind of make you swear an oath. You kind of actually promise to find a verdict according to the law as given to you by the judge. Uh, and if you don't take the oath, then they kick you off. So you might think, okay, so you have an obligation to follow that rule. Uh, similarly, if you become a judge voluntarily, you might think that you have to play the role of a judge. Okay, so what do I think about that? All right, so the first thing is, the first problem here is um, this argument is not taking into account the limitations of social roles. So it's true that creating a social role can create new obligations, it can impose new obligations on you that you didn't have before. If you decide to become a lifeguard, then you have an obligation to sit there on the beach watching and then try to save people's lives, which you wouldn't have to do, okay? Like, the lifeguard might have to take risks to his own life to save people who might be drowning, where you don't have to do that if you didn't voluntarily become a lifeguard. So it is true that you can acquire new obligations, by taking on the social role voluntarily. Um, but you cannot suspend your pre-existing obligations. You can only get additional obligations. So taking on a social role voluntarily does not, for example, suspend the rights of third parties that had no choice, right? So like, you know, you, you take on the role of being the lifeguard, so now you might be obligated to risk your life to save people who would be drowning. You do not have the right to force third parties who didn't agree to become a lifeguard to go and help, right? Uh, at some risk to their life. Okay, similarly, if you take on the role of a judge, you might acquire additional obligations, but that cannot suspend the pre existing rights that other people have. Other people who didn't agree to, you know, get involved in the system, like the defendant who was just like forcibly taken before the court. So the fact that you've taken on a social role does not suspend his rights. So it doesn't give you the right to commit injustices against that person, even if that is the role. So here's an example. Uh, you go and um, you know, the mafia has put a, an ad in the newspaper for you know, a new mafia employee, and you voluntarily show up at the mafia boss's house and like, you sign up to do this job. And the job, like the mafia errand boy, um, the job involves picking up the laundry for the boss and you know, like, taking the boss's dog for a walk, and also beating up people who fail to pay protection. <laughs> right, so those are your duties, and that's the role, and that was explained to you at the beginning, and you voluntarily agreed, you know, you signed this contract that says that you would do that. Now, so, are you obligated to beat up the people who don't pay protection? No, right? And the reason is, so, well, you can't, by contract, just get rid of your obligations to third parties who weren't involved in the contract. Just because you agreed to take on the role doesn't mean that you get to do immoral things if there are immoral things implied in the role, then it's just an immoral role, but that doesn't mean that you get to do those things, right? Okay, so, um, you know, even if the role of a juror involves just applying the law as described to them by the judge, that doesn't mean that it's permissible to do that. Okay, what else? Um, here's another thing to say. Uh, okay, so the jury members make a promise to apply the law as given to them by the judge, and they're required to make that promise, otherwise they will not be allowed on the jury. Okay, now, by the way, um, you know, if, if this happens to you, so uh, just be aware that the overwhelming majority of trials result in conviction. Okay, so the conviction rate is something like 90%. Uh, and however, one juror has the power to at least hang the jury. So you have the power to at least cause a mistrial if you can't convince the other people to acquit. Okay, so that means that if you don't get on the jury, basically the guy's gonna be convicted. If you know that somebody's being prosecuted under an unjust law, then, uh, and if you want to stop an injustice from occurring, then you have to take the oath. You have to promise that you're going to apply the law. Otherwise, that guy will almost certainly be convicted and unjustly punished, okay. So now, here are some principles about promises. Uh, so, yes, normally you should keep your promises. However, there are some conditions under which you should break a promise. First, 
if breaking a promise is necessary to prevent something much worse from happening, then it's okay to break a promise. So, for example, you promised to pick up your friend at the airport, but suppose that at the time you have to leave to pick up the friend, um, instead of picking up the friend, you could save your neighbor from being kidnapped by terrorists. <laughs> you should do that, right? Don't go to the airport and save the neighbor from being kidnapped by terrorists, right? And like held in a cell for 10 years, okay? Uh, which is comparable to what's going to happen to the defendant who's being prosecuted under an unjust law, right? Okay, uh, here's a second principle. Um, a coerced promise is not valid. So it's, if somebody forces you to make a promise, you can break the promise, just, you know, and you don't even need a good reason. You can just, like, just for the hell of it, okay? So if somebody points a gun at you and makes you promise to give them 10 cents, you make the promise, and then when the gun is gone, you can say, ha ha, I'm not giving you the money. You don't need any reason, you just tell me 10 cents, it doesn't matter, but you still don't have to do it. Okay, uh, in the case of um, a trial under an unjust law, so the government basically coerces you to make the promise. Right? But, so it works also if like, they're threatening a third party. Right? So somebody is threatening to kidnap your neighbor unless you promise to pay them $1,000. Uh, and you don't want the neighbor to be kidnapped, so you make the promise, and then as soon as the neighbor is safe, you immediately break the promise. That's totally fine, because that guy doesn't have any complaint, right? Because he didn't voluntarily agree. Okay, here's a third principle. Uh, whether or not you made the agreement voluntarily, it's okay to break a promise if doing so is necessary to prevent an unjust action by the promisee. So the person who received the promise, if they're threatening to commit an injustice and the only way to stop it is to break your promise to them, then you break the promise. Reason for that is they have no valid complaint. They have no valid complaint because it's their fault that you had to break the promise. So example, uh, I promised to loan my rifle to Justin over the weekend, and then after I make the promise, but before the weekend comes, Justin tells me that he's planning on committing several murders, and uh, that's why he's glad that he's gonna get this rifle. And then I say, then I'm not giving you the rifle, right? And then, he, and then he goes, hey, but you know, you're breaking your promise. And then right, he wants to sue me in court for breaking the promise, whatever. He's got no complaint, right? Because it's totally his fault, right? If you weren't threatening an injustice, then I wouldn't have to break the promise. Okay, uh, that is like the situation with the government. Uh, they're the ones who are threatening to commit the injustice, and they're the ones who receive the promise. It's a promise to the state to apply their law, as described by the judge. But the state is the one that's threatening to commit the injustice if you don't break the promise, so they've got no valid complaint about this. Okay, what else? Okay, by the way, um, another thing is, you know, they say that you have to follow your assigned role in the system. The assigned role of a jury is jury nullification. Right? Jury nullification is an essential part of the intended function of the jury. It's just not accepted by present day judges because present day judges are mostly statists, okay? But the reason why that provision was put in the Constitution was obviously to allow jury nullification. And there are multiple statements by founding fathers that say things in this neighborhood. Um, maybe the most, um, the most interesting statement was made by John Jay. So John Jay was one of the three authors of the Federalist Papers which was written to, um, to defend the new constitution before it was ratified, okay? Uh, so he was one of those three authors, and he was also the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. So if anyone would have known what the, what the function of the right to jury trial was, it would have been John Jay. Now, as it happens, the Supreme Court has held exactly one jury trial in its history, which was presided over by Chief Justice John Jay, right, in, in his term. Uh, so, and in that trial, um, Jay gave his opinion about what the law required to the jury. And then he gave these instructions to the jury in which he said, he basically said, you know, um, so I'm kind of an expert on the law, so you should take that into account when, when you hear my opinion. However, you do have the right to judge the law as well as the facts. And then now, go off and do justice. Right, he actually said, right, do on this occasion, as on every other occasion, impartial justice. He didn't say uphold the law, he said do justice, right? And he said, you have the right to judge the law. Okay, and by the way, there was no reason for him to say that particularly in this case, except that he was just making a general point about juries. 
because there was no question of nullification in that case. Like, that case was kind of easy, and like there was no, <laughs> no controversy about that law. But so it was, he was just making a point about what the role of the jury is. OK. Um, uh, but there are multiple other statements by other founding fathers, OK? So statements by John Adams, Jefferson, and Hamilton about how great uh, juries are and how they're a safeguard to liberty. And it's really hard to see how they're supposed to be a safeguard to liberty if all they do is apply the law as described to them by the judge. Like, then why not just have the judge do it, right? OK. Um, what else? Uh, by the way, there are multiple features of the system that uh, don't make any sense unless you believe in jury nullification. Okay, so here's a feature of the system. Uh, a judge is able to um, issue a directed verdict. So if, uh, if there's a trial, the prosecution presents their case, and at the end of the prosecution presenting their case, the judge thinks that's totally lame, he can just declare the defendant not guilty right there. Uh, without consulting the jury, he can go, okay, that guy's not guilty, let him go. Because, you know, the, state, the prosecution's case is so lame that no reasonable jury would be persuaded. However, there's no parallel provision um, if the acquittal is unreasonable, right? So if after the defense has presented their case, you know, both the prosecution and defense presented, uh, if it's totally obvious that the guy did it and like there's no, he's got no defense, he totally admitted in court they did all that, the judge still cannot direct a verdict of guilt, right? And uh, so it still has to go to the jury and if the jury acquits, you can't set aside that verdict either. Uh, and by the way, no matter what, like even if the jury says, ha ha, you know, screw the law, right? They said, that guy was obviously guilty but we don't agree with the law, so ha ha, we're letting him go. Okay. And like, uh, that's not a basis for overturning a verdict, right? Okay, so why is this? Like, well, okay, so what's the reason for this asymmetry? Like, you can give a directed verdict of not guilty, you can't give a directed verdict of guilty. Um, it's obviously because the purpose of the jury is to protect against unjust laws, right? Okay, um, what else? Uh, also, like, the jury is able to give inconsistent verdicts. So like they can say you're guilty of A but not guilty of B even, the, even if that is factually inconsistent, like even if it's impossible for you to have done A without doing B, they can say that and the judge can't, that, like that's not a basis for overriding their judgment either. So what, ration, like, what rationale could make that make sense? It has to be that the jury's allowed to disagree with the law, right? They're allowed to give verdicts that just, just are flatly inconsistent with the law, okay? All right, what else? Okay, another objection. Okay, uh, some people claim that my thesis is undemocratic and, you know, uh, juries and judges should defer to the democratically made law. So the laws that came out of the legislature were produced by the democratic process. The legislators were elected. The jurors were not elected. Uh, judges are sometimes elected. Sometimes they're just appointed by the politicians. Um, and, you know, they, uh, the people in general have not had a chance to weigh in on the particular case. So you should just, like, follow the laws that were made democratically. Okay. What do we think of this argument? Um, well, yeah, that's kind of lame also. So uh, the first problem is, okay, so the democratic process might make sense for certain things. Uh, if you have a set of alternatives that are already known to be permissible, then voting might be a rational way of deciding among these permissible alternatives. Okay, but if you have a set of alternatives and one of them is like already morally impermissible, is unjust, a violation of people's rights and so on, then voting doesn't do anything to change that. So like if a larger number of people want to do X than don't want to do it, um, that doesn't make it just. If it was already unjust, if it was unjust before, then the people voting doesn't make it become just. Uh, somebody has a right to something, a bunch of people voting against it doesn't make them lose that right, so. Um, and that would be accepted in other cases, so. Uh, what else? Um, it's also, um, the fact that a majority of people vote for something also doesn't give any significant evidence for thinking that it's just, right? And you know, you'd realize this if you like, you know, think a little bit about the democratic process in which, so first of all, like the majority of the voters, um, most of them don't even know their congressman's name 
right? Let alone have any knowledge of what policies he's going to implement. Okay, so if a bunch of people who only learned the person's name on the day that they walked into the voting booth, that's when they, right, they saw the ballot, that's when they learned the guy's name that they voted for, they elected somebody, and then that person voted for a law. That is not significant evidence that that law is just. If you haven't argued that the law is unjust, the fact that it came out of that process is not significant evidence that, um, that you're wrong. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, also, by the way, in many cases, there are outcomes of the democratic process that the majority of people would not accept. So consider the examples that I gave earlier, uh, like the guy who gets the 60 years in prison for the $40 worth of cocaine, the guy who got life in prison for the $88 forged check. Do you think the majority of people would agree that those are just sentences? Uh, so no. Now there may be a puzzle about how you can get outcomes that the vast majority of people would disagree with coming out of a democratic process, but for now let's just admit that that is in fact the case, that that does sometimes happen. So if that's the case, it's really hard to see like what argument makes it so that um, you would think that those outcomes are just anyway, right? Like what argument appealing to democracy makes it so that you should think those outcomes are just even when the majority of people would think they're unjust? Okay, what else? Okay, objection five. Uh, I may be going on too long here, I don't know. But, uh, I'll just try, I'll just go through five and six. We started late. Yeah. We started late because of Josh. Yeah, that's right. That's my fault. Okay, uh, fifth objection. Um, yeah, some people worry that, okay, this is particularly about jury nullification, but could also be about judges who, um, you know, engage in a, li a little bit of activism to try to overrule laws that they think are unjust, uh, you might think that it sets a bad precedent and it's going to lead to anarchy, right? <laughs> and, uh, oh. yay! <laughs> uh, and you'll actually find that said, like Robert Bork actually uses the word anarchy, like, you know, we're moving towards anarchy with these juries who are like voting on the basis of their conscience. It's so terrible that people have a conscience. Okay, anyway, so uh, you might think, oh, this is going to set a precedent, so now other people are going to look at that, and they're going to vote on the basis of their judgment. Now, even if your judgment is sound, you might not want other people to be voting on the basis of their own moral judgments. You might think, like, yeah, maybe most people have screwed up moral judgments, and they should just follow the law. So now, you know, if I follow my own conscience, I'm going to be encouraging them to do things that are wrong. Okay, I guess that's the concern. And then maybe, like, all social order will collapse. Okay, now um, unfortunately, it is not that easy to bring down the state. Um, if it was, you know, uh, me and Justin would have brought down the state a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, yeah, unfortunately, we actually have a lot of evidence that this will not bring about anarchy because it's actually happened many times. Like, there have been many cases of jury nullification, and it never brought down the government, sad to say. Right? So I'm pretty sure that another case is not going to bring down the government, okay? And one of the reasons for this is, after a jury gives their verdict in a case, nobody ever knows. Like, nobody knows why they gave it. They don't have to give any account at all of why they did it. So nobody even knows that you voted because you disagree with the law. Like, they don't know if you just weren't convinced by the evidence. They don't know if you were just retarded. Like, maybe you just didn't understand the fact that the guy confessed in open court, <laughs> or whatever. But moreover, nobody's even going to look at it. Like, how many court cases are you reading, right? Unless it's a trial of a celebrity, it's not going to influence anybody else because nobody cares, because nobody else is gonna look at that case except the guy who was in it, right? The defendant who gets acquitted, he's going to know the difference. And then nobody else, and the people in his own personal life, right? But like other juries in other cases are not gonna go and say, hey, you know, let's look and see what happened in that case that humor was involved in, right? Okay, now if you're a judge, then it might set precedence. Uh, so you give a decision where you like intentionally misinterpret the law and so on uh, in the interest of justice. Uh, and you know, it's not really clear if this is going to be a good precedent or a bad precedent, okay? Like, oh, maybe it will be a good precedent. Maybe it will set the precedent of people following the principles of justice, okay? But here's the thing, like, that has already happened so many times that if it was going to bring about anarchy, anarchy would have happened a long time ago. Right? Judges are constantly voting on the basis of their opinion and not on the basis of the law. Uh, they do that whenever it's convenient for the government, uh, not so much when you know, it's in the interest of justice. Okay? 
But so I have some examples. So one example is uh, almost all laws are unconstitutional, right? I mean, it's clearly over 90%, probably over 99%, uh, and straightforwardly so. Like anybody who can read English can figure out that they're unconstitutional. And that is because uh, there's a list of the powers given to the federal government in Article 1, Section 8, you know, it's like a page long, less than a page long. Um, and then you can just like look at the list and then you can look at the laws. And like there's, you know, almost none of the laws are any of the things on that list, okay? And also there is the 10th Amendment which says the powers that, that are not delegated by the Constitution to the United States are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So at minimum, almost all federal laws are unconstitutional given the 10th Amendment and given the list of powers granted to Congress, okay? Um, and, and I don't think this is, this is not like a difficult like libertarian point. You don't have to be a libertarian ideologue to see that. You could be like a communist, but just know how to read English. And you can just see that don't know how to read English. regulate commerce among the several states does not mean just make any regulation at all that has any effect on any trade, right? That's, that's probably not what it meant. Okay, anyway, going on. Uh, but judges basically, um, they just disagreed with the Constitution on that point, so they just said, yeah, we're gonna allow all these laws. So this was during Roosevelt's New Deal, after Roosevelt had succeeded in, um, you know, appointing like, I think, uh, yeah, he appointed 11 of the 12 justices. By the time Roosevelt left office, 11 of the Supreme Court justices were Roosevelt appointees, and the 12th, who was there before Roosevelt, was promoted by Roosevelt to the Chief Justice. Okay, so they were all beholden to Roosevelt. And then, you know, the court started saying, yeah, whatever President Roosevelt wants to do is okay. Right? Um, they were obviously not faithfully interpreting the law. They were making up what they wanted the law to be because they just disagreed with the existing law. Okay. Here's another example. Um, the practice of plea bargaining just obviously violates the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. So the Fifth Amendment gives you the right not to be forced to testify against yourself. The Sixth Amendment gives you the right to a trial by jury. Okay, uh, the practice of plea bargaining obviously violates both of those. So how so? Well, basically what it is is the prosecutor comes and he threatens to add additional charges or he threatens to charge you with a more serious crime or to recommend a longer sentence if you ask for a jury trial. And uh, in order to avoid that, you have to plead guilty, which means you have to testify against yourself. Pleading guilty is testifying against yourself. That is, if you plead guilty, you have to go up in the open court and say, I did it to the judge and promise that you committed the crime. Okay, so, um, well, you know, threatening somebody with additional punishment if they don't do something is forcing them to do that thing. Right, pretty straightforwardly, and that's consistent with other Supreme Court cases, okay? So there's another Supreme Court case whereby um, uh, it was not allowed for the legislature to attach a penalty that could only be imposed by a jury because that made it so that there was an increased risk if you go to a jury trial. And the Supreme Court said, well, you can't impose this additional um, expected cause for somebody exercising a constitutional right. So that provision of the law is out. Okay, but that's exactly what the prosecutors are doing all the time. So it's totally incoherent, right? Okay, but why did the Supreme Court, what, so the Supreme Court has said that plea bargaining is okay. And why did they do that? Because they disagree with the Fifth and Sixth Amendment, right? Not in all cases, but basically they thought, no, you know what, plea bargaining is so useful and uh, if, we struck, if we struck it down as unconstitutional, um, it would be so expensive. It would just be way too expensive because the government would have to do something like 30 times more trials, right? Because almost all convictions come from plea bargaining. So if you eliminate that, like you have to multiply the number of trials by something like 30, and we don't have the resources to do that. So we're just not going to enforce the law, right? That's basically what they were saying, but they did not say that explicitly. I am imputing that motivation to them, okay? But they did mention at the time that, you know, like a large majority of cases are uh, disposed of by plea bargaining. Okay, um, what else? Um, the courts protect the government from liability for failing to do their job. Uh, this again is something where the courts just made up a law because they, because it was convenient for the government. There's a law. Okay. Uh, um, there's a law from the Reconstruction Congress, so after the Civil War. There's a law that basically says, okay, so if somebody uses the law to violate your civil rights, you can sue them. 
Okay, and the reason for this was that um, the state governments were not prosecuting people as they were supposed to, so the Congress said, you know what, we're going to allow people to sue, which will give them some remedy in case like they can't get the violator prosecuted. Okay, and the text of that law starts with the words, every person. So every person who does such and such is subject to civil liability. Right, where the such and such is something about violating their civil rights. Okay, the Supreme Court has interpreted the words every person to not include prosecutors or judges. By every person, they didn't mean prosecutors or judges because, you know, <laughs> traditionally, <laughs> prosecutors and judges are uh, exempt from being sued for violating people's civil rights. Okay. And why was that? Oh, and then there's some like rationalization about how, well, we don't think that that was the intent of Congress. They probably just overlooked the fact that this could be used to sue prosecutors. Who would want to sue a prosecutor? That's, that's so mean. Okay, so, but now the thing is, um, and my point is like, when the courts um, find it convenient for the government, they freely violate the law. They freely make up the law, make up new laws, or just like, you know, interpret a law to mean something that it just obviously doesn't mean. They've done that many times. So why can you not also do that in the interest of justice? In addition to doing that in the interest of like the convenience of the government, like why would it suddenly bring down the government only if you do that in order to stop somebody from being unjustly punished? Okay. Uh, by the way, this has, it is sometimes done to prevent unjust punishments also, so there are some interesting cases of this kind. Um, there's a case where uh, there was a 14-year-old girl in um, Minnesota who was charged with distribution of child pornography. Okay, now, the law against distributing child pornography is a just law, okay? But this girl was charged because she sent a naked selfie of herself to a boy at her school via Snapchat, okay? And then the prosecutor in Michigan decided, oh, distribution of child pornography because we all, you're like an underage child. It's a picture of an underage child and you sent it and the law doesn't say that the perpetrator of the crime can't also be the same as the person who's depicted. It also doesn't say the perpetrator of the crime can't be a minor. So ha, huh, you violate the law. Okay, then she was gonna be subject to 10 years in prison and she would have to register as a sex offender. So basically it was gonna ruin her life, okay. Um, yeah, I don't think that, so I don't think that's what the legislature had in mind when they made the child pornography statute, but that is, that does follow from a literal reading of the text. It's not ambiguous, like, it, like if you read the text literally, it clearly applies to what she did. Uh, the judge just threw out the case, right? He just said, no, that's stupid. <laughs> so um, it is possible, and then that's it. And then now the, and nothing happened. You know, the government didn't collapse. Like we didn't go into this um, wonderful state of anarchy that, that we've been hoping for. Nothing happened except that that girl's life wasn't ruined pointlessly, right? So, uh, you know, occasionally people do this thing that, you know, some judges say you're not supposed to do. And the only thing that happens is that you avoid an injustice. You avoid an injustice and then some other people who are authoritarians get mad at you and then they move on with their lives. Okay. Objection six is the last one before I start. Uh, some people say, well, you know, society needs predictability and uniformity, and uh, individual judgment is too variable. So if we have juries, um, you know, judging the law, whether they think the law is just or unjust, then you're going to get different outcomes depending upon what jury you get. You won't be able to predict the outcome based upon the written law. It's just based upon this person, this group of 12 people's opinions. Uh, and this violates, quote, the rule of law. Right, which is a nice phrase that the um, authoritarians like to use. Okay, what do we think of this? So, uh, you know, first thing I wonder is, okay, well, why does discretion on the part of government officials not violate the rule of law? Right, so this objection is only made when you're talking about um, discretion, well, only certain kinds of discretion, right? So when you're talking about discretion on the part of a jury, exercising their judgment, people say, oh my God, you're violating the rule of law. Okay, but what about discretion by a prosecutor? Because prosecutors have an enormous amount of discretion. So uh, they get to decide what to charge somebody with or whether to charge somebody at all. They don't have to charge somebody even if they can, like even if they have evidence, uh, enough evidence to charge somebody, they don't have to do it. Uh, and then there's usually multiple different statutes that they could charge somebody under that would be supported by the evidence, and they get to decide which ones. Uh, they, can, they can do all of the charges, they can do only some of the charges. 
Um, and so this gives them enormous discretion. Uh, if they think that even though the person violated the law, you know, it wasn't really wrong, they can just like not file charges. Uh, nobody says, oh my God, we have no rule of law. Like that's the status quo right now. It's prosecutors are already having that discussion. Nobody says, oh, no rule of law. We're in a state of anarchy. Um, so why would it suddenly destroy the rule of law if juries had discretion? Oh, I know, it's because prosecutors are government officials and juries are ordinary people. Okay, so the people who say this only think that government officials can exercise their judgment, but they don't think that non-government people can exercise their judgment. Uh, I think that's the opposite of the truth, right? I mean, there's a problem with government officials having too much discretion because they can use it to abuse their power, right? There's not really a problem with juries having too much discretion because they can't really abuse their power. They're in there for that one case and then they're, they're off. It's not like they can go and like go around oppressing the community because they have this power. Okay. Juries run amok. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, by the way, judges also have a lot of discretion. Um, they have discretion in sentencing. Um, they used to have, so they used to have more before there was this revolution in sentencing laws. And then they used to have less before a relatively recent Supreme Court decision that said that the sentencing guidelines were only advisory. Okay, so now they have a significant amount of discretion in what sentence they offer, and nobody says that that undermines the rule of law. Uh, also, by the way, there's unpredictability in the system just based upon factual judgments, not moral judgments. So whether a jury will consider a given body of evidence to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt, that can vary from one jury to another. That's a matter of subjective judgment. But nobody says, oh my god, you know, you have no, there's no predictability in your quantity, right? The outcome of jury trial cannot, in fact, in actual fact, even if the jury doesn't nullify, you can't predict the outcome of jury trials very accurately in advance. Right? And it's going to vary from one jury to another because there's this stuff about proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is really vague in a matter of judgment. But still, nobody says, oh, so if you're on a jury and you think that most juries would vote to convict, you should vote to convict in order to increase the predictability. Right? Nobody says that, right? So suppose that you're on, you're on the jury in this trial where there's no nullification issue, there's just an issue about whether there's enough evidence. Suppose you think that the evidence is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but you also think that most juries would vote to convict in this situation. Question, should you vote to convict in order to increase the predictability and uniformity of the system? No, right? And that's uncontroversial. So even the anti-jury nullification people would agree. No, you vote to acquit, right? Okay, but you know, how is that different, right? Their argument is, oh, if the jury votes to nullify the law, that's going to make things unpredictable and not uniform because you know, in other cases the person would get convicted, right? How is that different from my case, right? Okay. Uh, finally, you know, here's a moral question. Um, so which is better, having uniform injustice or a mix of justice and injustice? Right? So let's say you know, there's 100 cases that come up, and like, one option is all 100 times you get the same injustice. And another option is 50 times you get an unjust outcome, and the other 50 times you get a just outcome. Which is better? Well, you would have to have an insane level of commitment to uniformity. <laughs> like, so I'm like, uh, I guess really weird aesthetic preference, right? Really strong aesthetic preferences to say the uniform injustice is better, right? So, yeah, okay, uniformity is good in some things, but only if it's like uniform justice, right? So there's no point in making things uniform in the unjust direction. Okay, um, that's all I have for now, so uh, maybe I'll stop and take questions. So, um, you, I mean, so 
basically take somebody to be more committed to justice than the majority of people or the majority of lawyers are. Uh, so there probably is not a way of bringing that about. Um, I mean, so there could be rules, like the American Bar Association could have like these ethical rules, and then they could, you could be like subject to disbarment for the violent rules. I don't know. Um, but of course, they're not going to do that because that's not in their interest either. Because like the members of the ABA are other lawyers, and like they're profiting from you know just serving the highest bidder. So yeah, why would they do that? I mean, you might think, oh, well, maybe there could be a law. Okay, so there could be a law, but that, that's probably not going to work out very well either, right? Because then it's like, well, you can't trust the government to decide, basically. Like, if there was a law, you can't represent people who are obviously guilty, then that means the government has to decide who's obviously guilty, and you can't really trust them to do that. Okay, yeah. So what are your arguments against putting people in government prisons was the abuse rates? And I did just very little research on this, but I, I thought it was a lot higher than it is. It's not actually that high in many places. It's still higher than in normal society. Yeah. But do you know what the rates are? For, you know? Yeah, no, so uh, no, and I don't think anybody else does. So there are surveys, and I've forgotten the numbers, but it's going to be something like a few percent per year, um, not more than that. Okay, but the problem is that um, it's probably underreported. Right, so like when you survey the prisoner, they probably do not report most of the abuse that they suffer. Um, yeah, so now the amount that is reported is, you know, like, uh, well, it's enough to be disturbing, but it's not like, it's not like a guarantee, okay? But, um, but there's probably a lot more, so. Um, yeah. Can the jury ask the judge what the sentence to be before they apply the verdict? Um, so you can ask, but uh, you'll probably not answer it. Uh, and he'll probably say, no, well, you know, the sentencing is up to me, so there's no reason for you to have that information. Uh, so, now, that's not guaranteed to happen, so uh, there is an interesting um, decision that I read. Uh, so there's this case, U.S. v. Polizzi, and it's a case where um, the decision that I read, I think, is um, a trial judge contradicting his own earlier decision. So what happened was the defense attorney wanted to be able to, um, he wanted the jury to be informed of what the punishment was going to be, right? Like this guy was going to have a mandatory minimum five-year sentence, okay? And then the judge originally did not inform them, and then later said, oh, that was a mistake by me, okay? And then so his reasoning was, and this was, this was like this really remarkable opinion, he said, well, you know, the purpose of the jury trial is to allow the possibility of jury nullification, and one of the reasons for nullification might be that the sentence is too harsh, and so the jury has to be informed of the information that they would need to tell them that's the case, when the sentence is too harsh. And it's like this really long opinion that goes on for like pages and pages, like citing all this um, evidence from you know early America of what the purpose of the jury trial was, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the reason why this judge didn't originally inform the jury was that he was afraid that the prosecutor was going to object and like take it to the appeals court and then the appeals court would overrule them. So, but anyway, uh, so there are some cases where the judge will allow that, but usually not. Uh, you might have to like look it up on your phone or something. Anyway. Um, yeah, Justin? I want to push back a little bit on the idea that a lawyer should not represent somebody they know is guilty. I think that's an easier case to make in court or civil cases, but criminal cases are the state versus the person. And I think it's a very good idea for lawyers to vigorously represent people when they're facing the full force of the state. Because even if that person did really steal whatever the state says they, they, they stole, the lawyer knows, I know my guy's guilty, but I'm facing the state and the state throws in the kitchen sink, as you said. So the, the guy needs somebody to vigorously defend them, even though he probably did steal something. Yeah, so you know, let me like clarify what my thesis is there, right? So my thesis is not that it's immoral to defend a guilty client, um, which is sort of like you know the, the um, short, simplified version. But that's not the correct thesis. The correct thesis is it's immoral to pursue an unjust outcome. So defending a guilty person might be actually pursuing a just outcome. Sure. Sorry, so like maybe he's guilty in the sense that he did what he was accused of, but what he was accused of might not have been wrong, so then you should defend him. 
Uh, or maybe what he accused, was accused of was wrong, but the punishment he's going to get is excessive. So then, you know, maybe it would be less unjust if he was acquitted and try to get him acquitted. Right? Or, you know, you just like go into this negotiation to try to get him a lower sentence or something like that, um, where he would have gotten an excessive sentence. So that's all okay. But um, you shouldn't act, actually try to bring about the unjust outcome. You shouldn't try to get him totally off if he's like committed a heinous crime. Right? So, uh, yeah. I think this how do you describe the dichotomy of consequences within what prosecute with the, what mistakes the prosecutors are allowed to make and the consequences that befall them versus the defendants and the consequences that they make and uh, or the the wrongs that they make, and the consequences that befall them. Basically, I look at it like prosecutors can ruin someone's life in a, in a matter of days. They can put them in jail. They can expose them to uh, horrible conditions where they're, where not, they're not thinking clearly. They're not uh, able to uh, defend themselves. And it, it, that's all for not. The prosecutor doesn't face anything where, on the alternative, the defendant can yeah. the life is ruined. Well, so, like, the defense attorney doesn't face any consequences either. <laughs> so, like, it, oh, well, you know, just keep in mind that a defense attorney can cause horrible consequences. It's like, they get this criminal to go free, and then he goes out and commits more crimes, right? Which could, like, ruin multiple lives, um, right? But also true that the prosecutor can ruin somebody's life and totally get away with it, okay? And so, if I did something comparable, like, if I imprisoned somebody for 20 years, who didn't do anything. I myself would go to prison for like 20 years or something like that, right? Which would which be fair, I guess. <laughs> if the prosecutor does that, nothing. Okay, now, um, so, like the prosecutor is not at risk, but neither is the defense attorney, the defendant is at risk, but that makes sense because like, the defendant is the one who might have committed the horrible crime, okay? Uh, but still, there should be some punishment for the prosecutor under some conditions. Okay, now, like, there are arguments against this, like, oh, but, you know, there would be too much risk for prosecutors in general, and, like, they're constantly getting sued in court and so on, but the thing is, like, no, no, look, you should be, it, there should be something you could do that would get you in trouble. <laughs> like, like, okay, it doesn't have to be, like, you get in trouble for every mistake you make, okay, fine, if they made an understandable mistake, maybe, let, you know, give them a break, but, if they like knowingly suppress evidence that would have exonerated this person who's on death row, right? <laughs> they just like tried to get that guy executed, or, or even did get the person executed um, intentionally, right? And then, like later they brag about it and they go to the newspaper and say, haha, I just like seeing innocent people die. <laughs> uh, okay. They could literally do that, right? They've never actually done that, they never actually admit that they just. One in the same person, sorry, okay. But they could literally do that and, and not get prosecuted because they have this absolute immunity and also not even be sued. Like you try to sue the prosecutor and like the court will dismiss it because he's a prosecutor. It doesn't matter what the evidence is, it doesn't matter like how egregious it was. As long as he did it using his using the powers of the prosecutor's office. If, like, if he just goes and shoots his next door neighbor, then he goes to jail. But if he uses the power of the prosecutor's office to commit what would have been a crime, he's totally off in another way. Uh, the only thing that can happen is he can get fired. Like, he might get disbarred, which has happened a couple times. But there were a couple of cases where a prosecutor served like a couple days in jail. Uh, and, but it wasn't for the prosecutorial misconduct directly, it was for like contempt of court or something. Like the court told them, hey, you have to release this evidence, and they didn't do it. So for disobeying the court, then you can, you can go to jail for a few days, uh, even if like you send somebody else to jail for 20 years or something like that, which has actually happened, right? Uh, anyway, so that's a, that is our system. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Two more questions. So Well, so uh, it's you know it's quite expensive keeping these people in jail. Um, to us, yeah. 
I mean, so uh, I looked at the statistics. I think it's something like $30,000 a year to keep someone in prison on average. Uh, so, I mean, you would think that they would want to stop spending all that money, um, but they don't. So, I mean, I think what's actually happening is sort of ideological. And so what's happening was like, uh, starting in the mid-1970s, well, these politicians figured out that it was good in election campaigns to be tough on crime. Just like start saying that you want to punish criminals more. And then what's your opponent going to say? Oh no, I'm pro-criminal. <laughs> oh, we're, give the criminals a break. <laughs> which might in fact be the correct just message, like the criminals are being over punished, but criminals are such unpopular people that you cannot take the side of criminals. So then the politicians were saying, let's get tough on crime, get elected. And then they passed these laws, right? And, and that's what happened. Um, and the politicians who are passing laws don't actually have to look at the particular cases, right? Like if the political leader saw these cases that I described, like most of the people who voted for those laws would probably go, oh, wow, that's fucked up. <laughs> like, like, they would probably not have assigned those sentences if they were the judges. But you know, they don't see the particular cases. They just like hear this um, abstract law and then, you know, kind of like sounds conservative or whatever, tough on crime or whatever, and then they vote for. Yeah. Those three cases that you gave. Yeah. Do you know if those punishments were shortened or adjusted um, or, or, I, or? So I think they were not, right? So, so they um, still in jail. I think they're in jail or dead. Um, so yeah, so I have not followed up on these people, but I know like the um, the case of the guy who got the life sentence, uh, I know about some follow up because he appealed it. Right, and Clinton, like he made the argument that this was retaliation for insisting on a jury trial, and the Supreme Court struck that down, so the life sentence stayed. Um, in some cases, like there's a possibility of getting parole, um, not at the federal level, but in some states. So I still some of these people could have gotten parole. Um, but like there was a big campaign to try to stop that from happening in the United States, like in the last 50 years or something. Right, where like, the voters didn't like the idea that somebody would be sentenced to 30 years and then get out after 15. Um, so they probably, yeah, they probably are still in jail. Okay. Give it up. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Drive safe. Uh, I know it's rainy still. We will be back in two weeks. Brandon Ward will be talking about practical ways to achieve freedom. So, have a good night. Thanks.